Actually, what happened is uh, my older my older brother <clears throat> became exceedingly successful in uh, in the in the encyclopedia business. He got out of the Second World War and went to uh, uh, went to UCLA and was going to got to go into business and got, went with Monroe, Monroe calculators and he sold them really well, but they didn't have any. They weren't manufacturing them. So you, when you don't deliver the product, it's worse than delivering a bad product. So he finally went to the book business and uh, he uh, subsequently came, let's see, he went with Americana and then he finally went with uh, Britannica. He was the senior vice president in charge of sales with Britannica. He paid a lot of money. He was very successful. So all the other ones, my second brother who became a minister, uh, my third brother became a minister, my sister became a minister, my father uh, became ordained, but that was just in support of my mother, who was the one who really had the gift. And my brother and I used to say, we were the only ones who went into legitimate show business. <laughs> As you can see, all this stuff <laughs> sits on television now. So you, you've had quite a career doing uh, guest bits and, and character fits, did you, before Hill Street came yeah. along? Yeah, I was, uh, when Hill Street came along, what was it? I was probably, uh, I got my equity card when, in 1958. Mm -hmm. Or I got to, uh, uh, went to Summer Stock for 12 productions in 14 weeks, and it was... Um, in uh, Michigan, the Barn Theater in Augusta, Michigan. And I earned uh, $30 a week, and they gave me board. Uh, and we got lunch. We got lunch. They gave me a bed, place to sleep and lunch. And I thought I was, I was in pig heaven. It was great. And it was wonderful. We had a great time. Let's talk about how did, how did you involve Woodcall Street Blues? Hill Street Blues uh, came my way because Stephen Bocco and I were very good friends. And the reason that Stephen and I were friends uh, was because of uh, his daughter, Melissa, and my daughter, uh, Emily, fell in love with each other. And therefore, you, you, you have to follow your children when they're... And the same thing happened with... Uh, we have two children, Andrew and Emily, and the same thing happened with uh, Andrew. Andrew became a very good friend. I mean tight and they and they still are to this day john himes and andrew's 37 and emily's 35 four something like that and uh uh peter himes was her was her father and i did five or so pictures with peter himes yeah. and some really good pictures and so it was through my my family through my children my children she's a little children shall leave the play i think they get to the park so when you started with Hill Street, were, were you on the pilot or did you come in a little later? <laughs> Actually, it was one of those conflicts. Hill Street, Stephen got the okay from uh, Silverman <clears throat> to do Hill Street. And then uh, she wanted to cast it and put it together. Uh, and he, Silverman said, uh, this is it. I give you the police tapes about Apache Junction in the, in the, in the I don't know, South Bronx. And uh, I, I want you to make this story, this police story. And the police tape was a, was a documentary. It was really quite impressive. So they, they decided to uh, do it. And he came up with a script. Uh, he, he, uh, and he said, I'll, I'm going to cast it. I want to cast it. all my friends. At that time, NBC was in uh, number three position in the toilet. And uh, they were going to do anything, but just do it good. Because you always do really good things when you're when you're the worst network, you want to sell quality. When you got nothing to lose, then we got nothing to lose. And Brandon was there, and then Silverman left, and Brandon came in, and Brandon said, "This is great. Go do whatever you want to do." So that's why they called it the. Uh, 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 um, they called it the, the. What's it? Oh, the what's the school that Stephen went to? It just went out of my head. Uh, in uh, Pittsburgh. Oh, uh, the, the, uh, what's the famous, the very wealthy man? Who, Carnegie? Carnegie. So they all went, there. it was the Carnegie Mafia is what they called them. 
So Barbara went to Carnegie and Bruce Weitz went to Carnegie and uh, Charlie Hayde went to Carnegie. There was, and then he got other people. To come. So he cast all of his friends in it. And there was a big hellabaloo with uh, the casting people at, at NBC. They just, uh, so even went over and had a meeting with them and they said, what seems to be the difficulty? They said, this cast, I, just, I can't approve of this cast. I don't know how, why he gave you the right to, you know, cast whatever you want, but I'm telling you, I disagree with it completely. And Stephen said, well, their quality, you know, they're all actors who worked. What do you disagree? Why do you, why do you not like? He said, they're so unattractive. <laughs> That's uh, what you can see. You can, when you're, when you're third and you want to do some quality, then you don't have to have a beauty, but we had beauty. I mean, my God. Everybody was, uh, I don't know, Veronica was good. Was there anything more attractive than Veronica? Please, she was on another plane. Mm. Mm. I did scenes with Veronica. And I'm going, I'm going to go in and look at and see. Uh, I'm going to do my, my thing where I was trying to keep in touch with what I was doing and what was going on in the film. I would go in and I would come out and go, I didn't, I didn't even see myself. Oh, I was sitting there looking at Veronica all the time. I didn't even see myself. And I thought, well, this is good. Could you show it again? And we've got to not keep looking at Veronica. She just jumped off the screen. Yeah. And Danny was a very attractive, is a very attractive man. Yeah. And so is Veronica. What? And both of them had very compelling, uh, oh. compelling screen presence. Oh, and did they? And the sexuality, I was just ripped. And I went, wow. That, that wonderful. There were two shocks at the end of the first episode. Do you remember? Uh, it's the end of the pilot. Do you remember those? Two shots? Two shocks. Two shocks, yes. That uh, that uh, they were together, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, that the guys had been... Well, in the first episode, uh, Charlie Hayde came back to life because Charlie was supposed to be killed. But he, the other commitment he had fell through, so he came back. What was the other shock? That was the two shocks. Oh, yeah. Shot, those two guys getting killed. Now they were killed in the pilot. The pilot. Charlie was. <laughs> Charlie was because Charlie had another another commitment. But it was uh, uh, that pilot is remarkable. I tell you something, and it's only happened to me uh, yes. maybe three times. That but to read a script and go, "Whoa, this is really good. This is this is a good script." And then you go do the script, and they, yeah, they're great. You know, everybody's coming together. And uh, the direction, Rob, Bob, Robert was, uh, and then they had a screening, and we all went to the screening, and it was the, the second time that I had walked out of a screening and said, "It's better than the script. It's really, this is really good. It's it's more than I ever conceived of on the script." And I had just happened to me a year or two before because I'd gone to do Bradford's first directorial effort, Ordinary People. And I just, I thought the book was wonderful. And, this, and, I, uh, and the, my neighbor behind me had done the, done the, uh, the, the um, uh, you can do it when you take it from a book and make it to a film. What am I going to say? Adaptation. And, and to, uh, uh, we shot it in Chicago and it was a lot of fun to do. And I, that's when I thought the Donald was great. And it was just. That was an amazing film, wasn't it? Just whole. Well, I tell you, when I went to see the screening and he had a screening at one of the studios and he said, I'm going to let you see it and uh, I'm out of here. And it's one of those things where it is. It's just silence. People go, yes. it's like, holy why. Redford's first directorial debut, wasn't it? Yeah. And he won Academy Award for that? Yeah. Mine. Yep, he did. And it's uh, it called the Academy Award he ever won. <laughs> he deserved this. He deserved it. But uh, what always happens to really big stars who are good and talented people is there's a little bit of uh, reticence. They have so much. Let's see if we, we don't have to give them the Academy Award too, do we? Because they're rich and famous and, but it was, uh, and, uh, 
It's uh, I'm going to waste a lot of your tape here. My okay. memory is going to go on. Later. Going on the on the train. Uh, what's his name? Who wrote it? Why he lived behind me? I, we took care of the kids. I, I babysat for him when he was in the. Oh shit! We'll come back to it. I'll, 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 All right. You mind. But he won. He he won best. He won the uh, the writing. Great. Oh, Sa Sergeant. Yeah, Alvin. Alvin Sergeant. Alvin Sergeant. Alvin Sergeant won the uh, Academy Award for. And how about? Talk to me for a little bit, and they're never going to hear me, so better. That's good. I know you're going to edit the hell out of but, this. But talk about, it was a time when, when, when Mary Tyler Moore had come off doing the Dick Van Dyke show and then Mary Tyler Moore, and yeah. everybody had this image of her. Yeah. Talk about the, the, the casting choice of Mary Tyler Moore in that, in that movie. Well, <clears throat> You know, I have great admiration for Redford, for Robert. And he, he, uh, because, and that's the way he's done, that was the way he did his career. I mean, he knew that he wanted to do something and he just kept working at it. And for what he's done uh, with Sundance, for what he's done for independent production, for what he did for himself and choosing to go and, uh, then he wanted to, he got this book and it came to him and he said, this is the perfect book for me. And then he got Alvin to write the script and he, and he started casting it. I, as a matter of fact, talk about, there's no way that you could do this thing in Hollywood. I was working with him on the, on the feature that he was doing before he did uh, Ordinary People, which was... Uh, Boy, am I having brain farts here. Which was uh, uh, about the horse. The hell is the name of that thing? Oh, um, with Jane Fonda. Yeah, with Jane Fonda. He and he and Jane are doing it. And uh, uh, yeah, I know which one you're talking about. So it'll. Um, I'll, I'll find it and edit it in. Yes. <laughs> no, it'll come to me. Anyway, he, the electric horseman. The electric horseman. So, well, I'm doing the Electric Horseman. We're in Washington. We're in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, and we get met up friendly and having a, a few laughs. And, and we're doing it in uh, Caesar's Palace where the horse is there. And we've gone and we had to ride the horse down and ride it out. And then they ran out of script to Sidney Pollack. You know, but the director caught up with Sidney Pollack, the writer. And so we had to take a little hiatus. Then we came back. What have you been doing? And I said, I, I read the most amazing books. I said, it's just terrific. I started to read this book and I could not put it down. It's, uh, well, he said, what's the name of it? And I said, Ordinary People. I mean, it's, uh, uh, and he gave me this funny look. He said, he said well, what'd you like about it? And I told him, I said, boy, this, what's, and he said, I believe you. I said, what do you mean? He said, I bought that as a property. I'm going to make a film out of it. That's my next project. I thought you were pitching me for a role in it. I said, I didn't know you bought it. I had no idea. So he cast me as uh, Sutherland's partner, brother-in-law, actually. And uh, it, was, it was great fun. And when, and when Mary Tyler Morgan, I went, absolutely, absolutely. And she was late. Yeah. She really, I thought, uh, I guess it's me gilding the lily, but I, I just thought. Actually, I mean, if you're, if you're going to say that's the best picture and you're going to say that's the best director and you're going to say that's the best adaptation, then maybe you should think about the fact that Donald and Mary uh, contributed to that process also. So maybe you should say, Hmm. Maybe they should win. Well, her her portrayal was a revelation. She'd never done anything like that. Oh before. no, she'd always have <laughs> thrown her hat in the air. Yeah. Just so in this movie, she stamped on the hat a little bit. Well, she said, you know, I can I'm I'm an actress. I can do that kind of thing. And a lot of people get stuck, you know, uh uh not you can't do everything. I remember the only the only film after he became a star that didn't make money for John Wayne 
was Genghis Khan. <laughs> <laughs> he went with a mustache like that, and they gave him the epicanthic fold. We got it. And everybody Chronicles. said, "Everybody said, where is, where is John Wayne? I came to see a John Wayne film, you know. He's, he's the con up there. Uh, <laughs> but it didn't make a nickel, and I mean, didn't make much. But part of that was from the fact that you, you go against type, you know. Once you find your screen persona and you're a star, you kind of have to stick with it. You want to... And the, the rest of us, in a, in a kind of wonderful way, who aren't stars in that sense, who aren't the stars. When I started in the business, a star uh, was, if the actor was in that film, it made money. If that actor used him, it made money. And even if it didn't make as much as it usually does, it always made money. That's a star. But the rest of us uh, get to play a lot of different roles and get... Uh, to exercise our chops in different ways. And, and that's a lot of fun, too, because I've played all kinds. I've played good guys, bad guys, dumb guys, smart guys, you know. The, the biggest tip-off I ever had was a, uh, an English actor. I was doing uh, I was doing Von Ryan's Express with uh, Frank Sinatra and Trevor Howard. And I'm playing an American soldier. And <clears throat> Michael Goodliffe, a very good English actor who had been uh, trained at RADA, uh, and I became friends because we were the second or third <laughs> characters in the whatever. And Michael Goodliffe uh, said to me, you know, Jim, he said, I think you're going to be a very successful actor. I said, really? He said, yes. Well, I really knew. Why? I mean, I did, you know, I was new. And uh, he said, because you're like I am. You seem to have an intelligent look in your eye. <laughs> oh, is that all? <laughs> you seem to. You seem to have an intelligent look in your eye. He was right. I started to get, you know, the, most of the stuff I started to get, was I was doctors and lawyers and, uh, you know, detectives and people who were, you know, professors and, you know, <laughs> It's just such a kick. But there was the well, what's really nice though is that you, you have sort of a solid citizen look, and then you go into Hunter, and there's just that little gleam of insanity mm -hmm. in your eye. Let's talk about Howard Hunter for a little bit. Well, Howard, I loved Howard. Howard, uh, I give you a. This is very candid of me to say, and maybe uh, egotistical or whatever it is. But Howard was the only character that I've played in what of for 40 some odd years I've been doing this job that made me laugh. I said, okay, what? Because I just, I, I kind of got the character, you know, and I was, uh, I was with it, with the pipe and the stiffness and the, uh, and, and the terrible, uh, secure and strong insecurity was always haunting him. And she just would make me laugh and they would write for us. Oh, did they write for it? They put uh, him in such wonderful situations. And he was, he, here was a man who, who uh, uh, sought validation. Here was a man who was, in fact, secretly always seeking love. You know, they always had him going off the meat hookers or whatever it was. <laughs> and he, 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 uh, he truly wanted uh, camaraderie and he wanted uh, contact. But his discipline would not allow it. He couldn't, couldn't quite get past what I call the SOB, which is SOP, which is in the military, the standard operating procedures. That's what you always went by. You had a gig line. You kept this line straight with your fly. And then it went right there and had to go all the way down. And you never got wrinkly. You know, it's all of that kind of thing. Which was the madness, which was the which was the conflict, the chaos of Howard. He was just he was just wacko. I was always trying to be right. And that's why I did the things that I did. I played, and it was fun to be with Stephen because he allowed us to do things. I said, I want him to wear glasses. I didn't need glasses at that time, but I want him to wear glasses. And Stephen said, well, yeah, well, it's reflection. You can check with the check with the BP and see if we can get that. Why? I said, because... It's a little failure in here. What? That he isn't 
you know, steely-eyed. It's just that he's kind of, you know, can't quite be perfect. And sent all of the fun of his character. And to this day, we just put out, you know, they, they put first the DVD out. I watched the pilot and I thought, what? Well, it's still good. It's still really good. How is the character? Was the character explained to you beforehand or did they just say, here's the script? And then you discuss the character afterwards. I think Stephen actually wrote it for me. Steve, because he, Stephen had never been in the military and I'd been, I'd done two tours in the military. And uh, he said, you, and I had done some play uh, wow. on Paris. Oh, yes, that was another. But I had done the shows, some of the shows before at, in, at Universal where Stephen and I got to know each other. And I'd always played kind of an up, up stiff upper lip, you know, uh, easy to play, uh, you know, uh, a tight necktie attorney or whatever it was, because which is just easy stuff for me. First of all, I seem to have an intelligent look in my eyes. <laughs> so, you know, as, they, as all actors would tell you, and I'm sure you've heard it before, play the costume. Play the costume. Fill the costume and play the costume. Don't get in the way of the costume. I mean, if you're if you're a good general, or if you're a doctor, or if you're a bum, play the play the costume. The costume says more than anything else. If you play the costume, the character gets to get the. the, the so I built this idea of the pipe, which was a little bit pretentious, hey. and he had the ring from. From uh, Dartmouth, there's a wonderful thing from Dartmouth to Danang. You know, he said to all of these palace dialogue that they, I, when I knew when they were really getting to it, because I would have to always go. I read the script and I get, oh, they're really doing it to me this week. I'd have to go to the thesaurus to find out what they were talking about, because they would go and get the most bizarre. Anyway, the idea of. Mm, Making him a military man, and uh, he said, you can do whatever you want. I said, well, I want to wear a uniform, and I want to wear maybe even a flak jacket. Some of this stuff is a little over the top. You don't always do that. You only do that when you're... But he was always ready, right? It's a funny man. Tell, tell, tell me, before we were outside, but the... Um makeup for him. You were talking about the line about Uvalidi validation. Oh, well, and the pilot. Now, the first thing I read about the character, he said, read, read the pilot, and then, you know, obviously the character of Hunters. And I read it, and I got to the, the first scene where he goes in to Frank, you know, we got a hostage situation in this liquor store. And, uh, and he's going, Howard, Howard, we want to negotiate. We want Henry to negotiate. We're going to hold it down. We're not going to have this thing. We'll hold you in the back. We don't need to have to, 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 to please. He said, oh, Frank, well, I'm there and I have, my guys need the validation. We've trained, we've trained, we've trained, you know, this kind of thing. We're going to go out and shoot a few people now. You know, once, once you've learned to do this, you have to exercise it. I did all kinds. They had one thing where I got trying to get an equestrian group, trying to get horses. I'm going to go out, and he bought him so and got himself his own horse. And uh, uh, the horse got sick and eventually died. And how Howard's down in there crying over the horse, passing away. Spending on dogs, you know, he had the Sharpe. He was always seeking affection. And then he had uh, uh, Wolfowitz, a little Jewish nurse where he really fell in love with him. That's when he was in the hospital and she was sort of pushing him to get married. And he was not sure that he wanted to get married. But, and then she said, you know, if we do get married, he finally kind of acquiesced a little bit. He said, we, 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 you, 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 you may have to convert. Howard said, convert? Yes, you know, Howard. How I said, you mean convert like that, like that colored entertainer? Oh gosh. 
And when I read the line, you know, you sit there and go, boy, you're going to have to do some really hard acting here because you cannot, you cannot give it away. I mean, you, Sammy. So what they did is had this thing. Sammy had, uh, was a big fan of the show. And we did a, uh, a kind of promotion interview thing uh, with Carson. So, and Carson got, and they said, this is it. And Sammy will be here. And so they, they put, uh, they put the clip on. Yeah. Sammy had come on and then I was the last guy and they put the clip on and they played it. And they can, back and Sammy was on the floor, upside down, holding his stomach <laughs> and going like this on the floor, <laughs> laughing so hard. <laughs> <laughs> like that colored entertainment. So that's when he was with, oh wait, no, oh, Mae No, it wasn't Mae Brittany. <laughs> that's, that's hysterical. Oh yeah. That's hilarious. Oh, yeah. It was, uh, we did all that stuff. It's, and, and, and Stephen always said, you know, we would get these letters where we would, uh, say that the, uh, let's say the uh, Taiwanese or the Japanese or the whatever it was restaurant and a Chinese restaurant was found to be using tra trapping rats, you know, and or, yeah. or you know, stealing the yeah. cats of the neighborhood and the uh, terrible things. Or when we had one about uh, Charlie Hayes, Chad died and we kind of took the funeral business uh, for a little bit of a ride. Well, he, people would write in and say, I'm going to sue you, man, it's terrible. And they, <laughs> Stephen would say, listen, it's not a campaign. It's just that you happen to be in the pickle barrel this week and we are an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> we will offend whoever we want to offend. So that week he was offended. He was offended converted Jews. I don't. What do you think? Uh... What do you, I've, I've asked everybody about their characters because yes. you know, now it's been a couple of years since the show's been on the air. What is Howard Hunter doing today? These characters are real to the audience. Oh, sure. So what's he doing? Oh, what a good question. Oh, I suppose uh, Howard Hunter would be retired, I don't know, in Coeur d'Alene or someplace like that, uh, where other uh, military officers retire. He would be... Uh, he would be taking some courses at the junior college just to keep himself on top of it. He would probably be writing uh, a criticism uh, of the military adventures that have come along since, since his time when he was. And uh, that he was still available if they needed a consultant on how to go about this business because I think they've lost a little esprit in a certain areas. Uh, you have to have plenty of preparation. You know, all of that kind of thing would be going through Howard. He would, he would, be, he would be correctly critical and offer his services. Would he be critical? <laughs> oh, I think so. Yeah. yeah, I think so because he always, he, there was a way to do it and a way not to do it. You know, he, you, we have to have you know, that's why he wasn't, he wanted a tank, you know, you gotta have, you, you, you know, you gotta be ready, you gotta be ready for every situation. <laughs> that was one of the best of the tank. And, and, and Trevanti played it. He was the perfect straight man. Oh here, yeah. Trevon oh yeah. I remember, I think, uh, oh, you know, such terrible things you say. Uh, I had a, I was, why I pitched the tank was that I showed you what you had to have. You have a, to have a tank and I had a mock-up, which they always do and get organized and the tank. And he said, uh, uh I have, uh, and over here, you can see some scale model Hispanics. I mean, it was just, I don't think you could do anything like that today. I mean, we just, and we had, you know, we, we had, uh, what they call standards and practices. We had, we had censorship. There are certain things that you could, I got letters and it was about me cursing and you're taking the Lord's name in vain. And he said, what? He said, Stephen says, you gotta read this letter. They're really upset. I'm gonna come down and march because you cannot take the Lord's name in vain. <laughs> Judas H. Priest. Which, which I said all the time, Judas H. Priest. 
you know, and <laughs> Wait a minute. Well, have we got something? Is there, is there something missing here? <laughs> oh, yeah. We got to. Uh, the fun of it is. All right. Wait one second. The fun of it is uh, the tone of the show is set by who's in charge, and Stephen was in charge. <laughs> and. Uh, he brought in really interesting writers, many of them who've gone on to success on their own. But they were, we would always have a title for a Hill Street script. And the title of the first one was a Hill Street Station. And then once on, so we were in about the second or third year. And uh, I don't know, there must have been uh, some kind of a, a, a Cape Canaveral or Kennedy thing that had gone on and uh, the shot and we were in a space or whatever it was, but they were looking for a title and they just couldn't come up with one. And it didn't have, this title had nothing to do with the, with the storyline because we always had two or three stories going in each script. And this title was uh, Moon Over Uranus. And uh, it was just a little, little. So standards and practices, the censor called and said, you have to take out this. You can't put that dam in there. You know, you put it in there. You can't say that. And you can't say shit. You know, you can't. Why do you put it in there? He said, okay, I might let out. That was good. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he said, and you have to change the title. He said, change the title? Why would I change the title? He said, you can't have that title. We have to change that title. He said, wait. Why? I mean, the title, the title isn't on the screen. Nobody says the title. Why would, why do we have to change? He said, because, because, uh, you know, you've won so many Emmys and I'm afraid that if you win an Emmy with this show, it'll be, uh, and the winner is Hill Street, the Hill Street chapter of Moon over Uranus. And mm -hmm. Stephen said, I've had a lot of backhand compliments, but this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. He said, get out of here. <laughs> don't, oh, you can't do it. He said, I'm not talking to you anymore. He said, don't call me about that. That's, that's, don't call me. The guy called back and he said, tell him not to call me. And so the next script came out and Stephen said, titled it, Moan Over Uranus, The Saga Continues. <laughs> well, how would you like to have somebody running your company and doing and having the fun that we were having? We just had nothing but fun. So he finally called up and said, "Oh, you're not going to you're not you're not going to do this to me again. I won't. I won't. But please, I won't. I'm done. Don't worry about it. I give up this argument." Sector continues. So the next, it's just to give him a good shot. The next script that came out was. Moon over Uranus, the final chapter. This drove him crazy. It was such fun. Oh my goodness, that couldn't be on the DVD that way. Well, I, I, I don't, I can't remember whether we did that or not. There were a whole bunch of us when they did, when they interviewed us for the DVD. But I, I it was just they had, they had things where they would design a ending of a. Of a, of a, uh, act. Yeah. You know, we had three or four acts. They would design the ending of an act for a, give a little shot. I remember I had a girl that I was, uh, interested in, and her name was Lata Goo. She was, uh, she, she was a prostitute. <laughs> well, they used to say things like, uh, these, and they got by because nobody was, nobody was paying attention because they're always, Ch -ch -ch our, uh, uh, Veronica Hamill would walk through the station house on her way, you know, to do something with the Carrillo. And there would be, well, two professional characters and she would walk by. And one guy would say to the other one, that's the high priced spread. <laughs> It was, you know, that was Nuco or whatever it was. Somebody, some advertising butter thing would say, oh, get the high price spread. And they would always find this. And that was, uh, 
gosh, what did we do? Oh, we ended an act once on a on a on a on a line of uh uh gosh. Wow. Oh, it was a it was a hostage situation again. This is a hostage situation in a grocery store. I mean, in a, uh, um, a you know, in a chain market store where they had a butcher shop and all kinds of things. And um, the the uh, the perpetrator had come in to to um, the perpetrator had come in to rob it, and they had set off the alarm, and the police had all arrived. Yeah. So he had taken hostages into the into the freezer of the, of the meat locker and uh, to scare uh, and, and to frighten them into negotiating, he fired his weapon into a side of beef. And, uh, and the, the, oh my gosh, you know, and that was, and this was the first act. And was, and we get, so finally he uh, acquiesces and he surrenders. Now they ha have to uh, go in and get the evidence and everything else. So Charlie, and Michael Warren, Charlie Head, Michael Warren are a team, salt and pepper team, as we call them. And they would go in and they would, Charlie says something like this, uh, uh, you know, we can just cut this section up and wrap that up as evidence and send it to the lab. But we could tell them that it's still in there and we have to take this side of beef down to the station to have it taken care of. And then, you know, next three to holiday, we'll have a barbecue and we'll, We'll have this. We'll just take it now. Okay. So they wrapped it all up and carried it out. And as they carry it out, meaning the storyline has ended, Officer Bates pulls up right next to their car. And Charlie and Michael look at it and say, Officer Bates, well, would you mind if we put our meat in the rear of your unit? And it goes to black. <laughs> it's just, you know, whoa, uh, isn't it fun? Unless you point to it. Uh, yeah, nobody gets it. You know, you sit there and go. Well, they, get, they used to eat a lot of things. Oh, well, they put, we put, so, you know, they were always looking for, you know, uh, the yeah. pH word and then all of that kind of stuff. Well, you know, you can't use it. And anyway, it gets boring. But the subtlety of the humor and the humor is always there. It's always there about sexuality, about, uh, uh, you know, the whole, the whole processes about racism, everything. It was all in there. That's the whole petticoat junction, Hooterville joke. Yeah, sure. You know. Absolutely. Um, there were a lot of other sort of quirky characters in the, uh, in the squad room over there. Yeah, who? Were there ever? Were Whoa. there ever? Want we'll to talk about some of, some of your favorites? Oh, of course. Brucey. I just saw Brucey yesterday. Brucey playing. Uh, Felker the Biter. He was wonderful. He, you know, he was the one who uh, had this pension for jumping on people and getting them because he was small. And so, uh, or not as a uh, statue. Uh, so, but it was a fabulous character. Um, J.D., who, who uh, was uh, with Torian Blacks, who uh, apps always on the hustle, always on the hustle. Got this to do, got that to do, you know, we go down there, these are other cover, but, you know, maybe we'll just take a little this way. You know, all of that that was the, uh, and the, the remarkable, I think, tr truly uh, mm -hmm. remarkable a character of uh, Esther House. He really knew it. Oh, those speeches were classics. He was, he was, we never replaced him. They tried to get someone that brought in Bob Prosky. I'm, I played it once, John, the Joe Spano, they had Joe Spano doing it. Nobody could do what, uh, oh, six foot six. Polish Jew. He was so, oh, he, he was remarkable. Michael Conrad? Michael Conrad. He was really remarkable. So, can you talk about that period? I mean, uh, it may be difficult or whatever, but talk about what happened and just sort of walk me through that story. Well, what happened to us that we, uh, uh, we made the show, I think we went on, uh, we shot it in, 
We shot it in March of 1980, and then uh, it came out in 81. Okay. Uh, we did, uh, I think, 16 shows of 17. We had 13, and they took, uh, yeah, 17, and they gave us four more. Nice. Uh, <laughs> when we came Emmy time the next year, we were in the 12 categories. We were nominated. We won the Emmy in eight of them. And in two of those categories, there were only Hill Street people nominated. Uh, the, the one best show was that. Um, and Michael Conrad uh, won best supporting actor. Uh, and Danny won best actor. And uh, Grace won best actress. Uh, and she was... Uh, she she was not a regular on the show. Uh, and so Conrad won again. He won two Emmys in a row. And he was uh, beyond, I mean, it was, we thought, my gosh, nobody else is ever going to have an opportunity. The rest of us, we had, you know, we had two leaders. He had two leads. He had uh, uh, Trevanti and, and uh, Veronica Hamill. And everybody else was, you know, supporting actors. So that left 12 other actors trying to get, trying to get nominations uh, or trying to be uh, recognized. But he was extraordinary. And in a way, the, uh, the amazing thing is he had a line that he spoke that told the, the heart and the story with the quintessential line that told the story about what Hill Street was really about. Hill Street was about the police experience as a human experience. With all the foibles and silliness and, uh, you know, bad breath and slippery peels that we all go through in life. And trying to maintain the dignity and the integrity of being uh, in law enforcement. It was that, let's be careful out there, that line, it's that single line, this what this was about. This was about guys doing a job, but it's this job, you know, you, you packed a 44 Magnum. You and I are not packing any weapons here today. We're just having a, whoops, we're just having a good time. But you're always, you're always at risk when you're in that. And the doctors and the police, they always have this problem. They have the problem of addiction, of divorce, and suicide, which we put Howard through, too. So that's, I think that uh, Michael was remarkable because of the language he used and because of the humanity he spoke with. And with that line that ended for what we call the opening or the preamble of what was going to happen that day, which is now let's, don't forget, let's be careful out there, which is an extraordinary. Uh, well, we had those. That was the only show I've ever done, even sometimes to this day, where people quote the dialogue. They they dealt with his passing in the storyline. Oh yes, very very sensitively. Would you talk about that? Sure. I'll tell you how sensitive we were. First of all, there was always humor in it, right? So, um, Michael had uh, developed um, kidney cancer, and then it began to spread, and we began to have trouble. And he would come in only one day and he would do that speech. He died in the middle of the third season. And he would just get through that speech and then he wouldn't do all the other things that he would, you know. And the two years before he was dating a high school pom-pom girl, you know. And it was the, it's always... Um, it, became, it got tougher and tougher and then... He did indeed pass. I don't know if at least even coming down, I had something to tell. I never knew. Shut down production. And he said, uh, told us, 
when we all really uh, wept, it was it was not. And uh, someone said, oh, what, what can we do? And, Ma, and Stephen said, we're going to write a show about him. We're going to have him die on the show, and we're going to let him. And so the story, the story is about that. And finally, we, we go down after he's died, and we're now we're the characters in the show. And we go down to the Hill Street section. We go down into the toughest part of town where he had worked as a beat cop. And everybody, uh, well, about six or eight of us are down, go down and we're sitting there and I said, what are we going to do with his ashes? She said, we're going to do something with his ashes. I said, well, we're going to spread them down here in this cinema's kind of dreary and cold. And so everybody has their moment where they, they take a little container of his ashes and we say, you know, Michael, this is where you became a man, you know, and it was, and we were all, and everybody puts it, put it in. So then Stephen, it's the end of the scene, what is getting back in. You can just see, going to get on the doors closed and you hear, the red light. And a street cleaner comes. <laughs> That's the end of the show. That's genius. It is just genius. It's just, it's, you know, you have to. You, it, it is what we all had, but by God, Stephen was the leader of it. I mean, there were the, everybody contributed, everybody had ideas and did things, but. But to, to say, no, oh, I know. And then it would go. And uh, uh, the way it was shot, it was fabulous. It was just absolutely fabulous because, you know, you're going through this and you're waiting for the Hill Street, mm-hmm. you know, kind of lonely song to come in and the uh, haunting melody. Mm-hmm. Red light. <laughs> sweeps up all the ashes. Hey, off. Well, you know, life is what it is, and if you can't laugh at it, you probably are going to have a tough time. Do you remember the uh, final episode? You know, I don't, because uh, I had very little to do in the final episode. Uh, I had been uh, contracted to go work on the West End in London. <laughs> so, and they burnt down the station and all of that. Uh, I had to leave. I did. I think I was one the first day or two, and then I was out of there because I had to go yeah. and start rehearsal. Uh, and I don't think I've ever seen it, so I probably would look forward to seeing that. I really just because Stephen said, "Now nah, we're gonna let." Pay, pay. If it was a show, you know, that could have gone twelve, fourteen years. <laughs> and, uh, amazing show. And it was, uh, it was torpedoed by. It was kind of torpedoed by greed. Because you could take, you know, you could leave after, excuse me, seven years and you could have somebody else. This concept was so, well, actually it went on. Yeah. It became a legal show. <laughs> Golly Law. Called L.A. Law. And then it became NYPD Blue. And it became NYPD Blue. It, 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 it continued in its, yeah. in, in its concept for it quite a while. took punts and put a over. Sure. In the Absolutely. You know, and Dennis played... Uh, Played uh, Bunce, uh, came on the last two years, but he also played a fabulous character, I think in the second year, called Benedetto. Benedetto was a bad cop. And he did it wonderfully. He was a bad cop. I remember I was in there trying, trying to get him out. Yeah, I think he finally ended up killing himself. But it was... Oh, you know, I'm going to really look forward to it. I haven't seen that show in so long. I'm just, wow. It's wonderful, wonderful times. Wonderful times and wonderful wit. Because we were under the guy, under the pressure of, of a censorship, mm-hmm. you just had to be exceedingly creative in how you could express your disdain for this guy. And I think in a way, 
Maybe censorship made us better, made us more uh, uh, creative, more, uh, why don't we do it this way? You know, now you just, each one of us trying to find out a way to give an elbow to the pretensions that we are other than what we are, which are human animals. Like a bonsai around. tree. If you tie off one branch, it grows in another way. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, we, we, it seems like everything's go, going at a quick rate. There are billions and billions of us now. It's, uh, it's amazing. And we, you know, we did, uh, we did religions. We did, uh, we did wars. I would always talk about Vietnam, but it was, uh, we had, oh gosh, we had, uh, administration, politics, the chief of police. What was his name? You got his name there? I don't have it here, sorry. He was a great actor. Oh, yeah, he's a wonderful singer. Wonderful singers. So, did he, did he uh, make a debut on Cop Rock? I don't think so. I did. Did you do Cop Rock? I did Cop Rock. Hmm. They did one thing. Cop Rock, which I thought, I, I don't know if you'd ever seen the pilot. I think it's the best pilot I've ever seen. It was absolutely extraordinary. You know, He's guilty, judge, he's guilty. You know, he's, they sang this. Uh, the, uh, they had, a, they had a, the same thing, a turnout where they would have people uh, start and they'd usually have a song in that. Mm. And so Stephen said, I got a great idea. Come over. I, can hear, I said, I still got the jacket and the hat, I think. But he said, no, we can get it all worked out. And I had the pipe. And they were finishing off the opening and the turnout. And as they were singing, the camera was panning along over here, the men all singing over there. And there was, then they would pan and they would shoot them this way and uh, they would shoot them this way and when the music was going on. And they had me lined up like this. And at a certain point in the song, I just kind of moved forward and you got a profile of how our <laughs> That's plenty. That's cameo. More, little cameo. That's more, it was just terrific. It was just such fun. To... Let's, uh, let's move on to um, Doogie. Okay, sure. How did that come about? Doogie Hauser was, a, uh, was an outgrowth of Stephen's interest in child's prodigies, or his father was a prodigy, a viol. That's who you see. Father was a very gifted musician. And uh, he tried, he had a show on uh, at Universal that was a, a, a prodigy detective that he had written and it didn't go very well. It didn't, it didn't uh, work. And, uh, and it was, uh, it'll come to me. It was a show that when all of those shows used to go out on Universal, you know, one time Universal was totally dominating the airwaves. They had almost, oh, it was about six hours. It wasn't Universal. Everything else was uh, Universal. Richie Brockelman was the name of this show, who was the detective. And uh, it wasn't uh, exceedingly successful. Well, it ran for a little while. <laughs> so he decided that he was going to do this. This was his first contract with ABC. He had a 10-show contract with ABC on the air commitments. And he wanted to do this show. And it was about uh, the genius doctor. And we were looking for, he wanted me to play the father, and we were looking for... Uh, a child actor that could, could do the job. And it's, I, you know, I've said, Stephen, now I, I read the pilot, but you, you are going to stay on course here. I mean, this, this is uh, a, a story about this young genius doctor at 16, but you're not going to make the parents dodos. Ah, he said, 
Of course not. You can be a prodigy, but there's a few areas that you can't be a prodigy. And the most important area in this relationship that you cannot be a prodigy is experience. You must put in the time. So, and he, and he made, uh, he made uh, Doogie's father a doctor. So it, that, and from what it did, it was an absolute gorgeous stroke because it attracted both the children and the parents in the audience because they each had been empowered. The child is empowered because he's 16 and he knows everything, right? But the father is empowered too because he's a doctor. He's not 16, he's 56 or whatever it is. And he knows a lot more than you think he does. And so it gave, it gave empowerment to the parents and to the children. And they ended up when the show was, the show was rated as the most successful new comedy of that year. How brilliant to take what seems like, you know, a, a very, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem like the most believable concept. And then in that first 60 second opening, she tells you how it happened. Yeah. Which is, which was great. Oh, but and the type, the, the, the typing in the end, the typing in the end. And he had, if they'd wanted to go further to, you know, the logic of the show is it only goes four or five years because he, then he's just a, a very smart adult, you know, and that has no, that has no. But he was going to take it another step further had they kept it on and have him become a writer. You know, so he was going to become more and more interesting as a physician and writing and make him, because he always had at the end with the computer. And that was the sticker. That was the one that, you know, to put down in two sentences or whatever of what you have just seen, not make it boring and repetitive, but also make it but make it actually incisive mm -hmm. so that if you missed it in the story, this is just to tell you what it was about. And they worked them. Writers worked their butts off on those two sentences at the end. Mm. He'd finish it off. So we, uh, they cast, and I had seen Neil Patrick Harris in uh, Clara's Heart, I think was the name, with Whoopi Goldberg. For free. And, and uh, uh, I mean, he, he was really quite wonderful. But there's always this, you know, a little bit of reticence and resistance, as you've heard from all the actors that you've interviewed with them. Yes. Never, never with animals or children, because you end up, you get upstaged all the time. But this young man was wonderful. Oh, and in fact, Neil at that time, and I'm sure he's still as good as ever, but Neil at that time was a prodigy actor. Hmm. They had him learn uh, uh, sign language. They had him learn Arabic. They had him learn uh, languages. They had him, and he could, he was like, here he was. He, we shot the pilot, it was 15. He knew everybody, not only his lines, but everybody else's lines. And he was so thrilled to be there and he was so enthusiastic and he was such fun. He was really, really a, a great kid to work with. And I enjoyed it because I learned a lot. For the, yeah, yeah, for two more years, until he, was, until he was 18, you know, you could only use him for four, for four or five hours a day on camera. So in those first two years, Probably at least 50, maybe 70% of the time when I'm talking to him, he's not there. And sometimes we'd have these emotional scenes. And I remember the, I remember the operator coming up, coming up to me and he said, how? How do you, God, how can you do that? You know, because they'd have a light stand and they'd have an X and you'd be working on the X. Or they, what they did if you were close, they had a, they had a young boy who was 18, only small, and they had his hair combed like, and so you'd see the back of his hair and I would be talking to him. And he said, how can I, you know, how do you do it? I said, well, I was in the theater. I worked in the theater. He said, well, 
what does that have to do with it? They said to do this. I do the same thing in the theater. You know, I'm shouting off stage. But, you know, they're coming. You know, that's what we do. Act is act. Being able to communicate with somebody. Being able to, be, be, you know, being, being able to, to uh, think about the other position. Being able to, when you're dealing with your children, go, oh, oh, oh wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. I remember, you know. If you do character study, you're trying to figure out how other people work and how they, you just become a better citizen. Let's talk about some of the, so you, I have this list of shows. Oh my. If you want to play a little free association, if you can think of any uh, fun story or whatever, then, uh, then the. Oh, I, you know, I was going to say that uh, times that oh, yeah. uh, things, uh, other times that I've seen something mm -hmm. that I thought was uh, better than the script. I did uh, uh, these two that I've mentioned, which is obviously Hill Street and or Ordinary People. But I did another one, which I was very pleased with, which is called Doing Time on Maple Drive with Jim Carrey. And Jim used to work in the, in the studio next to us when we were doing Doogie House. And the other one, which is a free associate, that just came into my mind, that I did for, for uh, American Playhouse was uh, Dolly Hopdoodle's Haven of Blitz, which was Gene Shallard. No, not Gene Shallard. Gene, who was a writer. Shepard? Shepard. Did a, Dean, a Gene Shepard story. And it was a delight. It was something that uh, my agent said, you're crazy. You, they're going to they're gonna pay you minimum and you're going to go all over the place and work and they don't, they don't even have a trailer. I said, no, it's just a wonderful script and let's do it. Hey. And then I did a Faulkner play, a Faulkner film called The Golden Land. Well, these were all separate little projects. I mean, I've done a lot of films in it, but those are uh, the other three or four that I looked at and went, wow. Isn't it fun? I remember watching, um, was it Star Trek three that you were in? <laughs> yes. That is like fun. It was an absolute hoot. That was an absolute, absolute hoot. Was it like playing in the, uh, in the Star Trek, uh, universe? It wasn't, but it was like playing it. Well, not only that, but, uh, Leonard was directing it and Leonard and I are fairly decent friends. I mean, we've known each other for years and, uh, and, uh, the, um, uh, now this one, you'll have to give me a moment because I haven't seen him in years, uh, who, who produced it. Harp Bennett. Harp Bennett. Harp. I know. Harp Bennett produced it. He and I were good friends. He married a gal from UCLA when I was a school there. Harp Bennett kept me alive. Oh, over a few years, because I was not a terribly successful actor to begin with. I was, uh, I was struggling. I was... Okay, 12 years before I began to have any kind of continuity of a paycheck. My, I was a house husband. My wife went out and got a job and worked hard, and I was taking care of kids. But Harv Bennett said, call me up, and he said, I've got, I'm doing Star Trek Three, The Search for Spock, and whatever it is, and I'd like you to play a role. And I said, Harv, I mean, I'm, we're shooting on Hill Street. He said, oh, I'm going to organize it. It's not a big role, but it's an important role. And I need you to play it because I think you'd be perfect. And I had you in mind when I was writing it. I said, that's delicious. But I, he said, we can do it in one day. I said, you got it. So we did it in one day. He said, I can't pay you. I can't pay you your fees. I said, Harv, how many years? I mean, if it, you hadn't cast me and all of that stuff at Universal, I, I, I would never have, I wouldn't have had my health care. I wouldn't have, you know, be silly. See, you don't have to pay me. They said, no, I have to pay. I have to pay it because of you. But I am going to really pay. One of these days, I'm going to figure it out. So we did it. And we laughed and giggled and had a lot of time. Captain Styles, it was, with a little mustache. Well, a little pomposity there, too. I guess I am a pompous kind of guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, we all let those, some things go wacko. So he calls me about six months later. This is in 19... 84. And he said, I've got your paycheck. I said, what are you talking about? He said, for, for Star Wars. I said, what is that? He said, come home. I was in New York. Call me 
I can't want to call him. He said, I, I bought you and George Takai, who was also in it. I bought you uh, to carry the Olympic torch in the four 1,000 meters. And that I mean, they were charging, I don't know, 10 grand or something like that to do it. Oh, Jay carried it. So I said, oh, oh, okay. Uh, golly, that'll be, that'll be really fun. Now, what, what do we do? We're going to just walk around. No, I said, it's coming through and you have a place where you will carry the torch. So, okay. Is there any training that goes with this? He said, no, I know you're a jogger and you're in good shape. You just report that morning. They give you all this stuff and, uh, and you get to keep the torch. I said, oh, okay. This, and I came home and I said, I'm going to carry a, cor a torch. What is this? I don't understand. And she said, well, maybe it'll be fun. We'll all go. What? Okay. So the day comes, it's a Saturday. A couple of friends uh, come with me, Florian, the kids. I go and I get my underwear, which are little short, little shorts and my little jacket, and I have my own shoes. And uh, we're on Olympic Boulevard, which is called Olympic because of the 10th Olympics that took place in uh, Los Angeles. I mean, it's 10th Street. That was the first, okay, so I'm sitting there and there's a, there's a monitor there with me. Yes, this is where you're gonna change and what'll happen. You'll hear them coming up and then uh, you will get an instruction from, and what you do is you turn the gas on and I will get it started. And uh, I mean, the gas is on, I will get it started and you will hand it off and then you'll turn and you'll go down and there'll be somebody else a thousand meters away. I said, okay, it's a little cool for a minute. And, uh, and there's maybe 35 people standing around going, what the guy is standing out there in his underwear, you know? And I, and I said, got an Olympic thing. I was, there's a race coming through here. What I, you know, well, so up comes, and up comes this guy with the torch and he's, I thought, I was going to have a seizure for crying out loud. What the hell's wrong with him? He shouldn't let him run like that. So he hands me the torch. And I thought, boy, that guy, he was, oh, and he still tears and things like that. And as I get the torch, he said, okay, now you can start. I turn around and there's maybe 1,500 people. I don't know where the hell I came from. And I go, run, run, yeah, I'm going, the hell? And it's like, my God, there was nobody there before. Now, there are thousands of people, and I'm running, and I'm holding it, and, I'm, and they're going, yeah, and I'm going, yeah, 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 and I'm going, yeah, oh, let me go on. Princess, and I get to the, my end of my thousand meters and there's a, like a, a 14 year old girl and she's looking at me like I looked at the other guy. She thinks I'm a wild, crazy crocodile goof. I'm like, ah, 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 here we are. What a talk. Here, take it. This little girl's gone. Holy moly. I was as loony as the other guy came up and it was the most exciting experience to carry that torch. It thrilled me to death. I had no idea what was going to happen. And I called up Harv and I said, you did it. You did it to me. It was so exciting. I was so thrilled. I mean, I was, I was like, I was smoking whatever you smoke to get way up there and out. And I still have that torch. That's amazing. And the kids were thrilled. <laughs> and nobody except a friend of mine who happened to come along to see what was going on took any pictures. <laughs> it was just... So that's, uh, that's the, uh, search for Spock. <laughs> Payback to the search for Spock. Payback for the search for Spock. Wow. Um, is this true? You were on my mother, the car. Oh yeah. So I've got some good ones. I've got my mother, the car and okay. Crackerby with, uh, with Burl Ives. <laughs> my mother, the car with, uh, with what's his name? Jerry, Van Dyke. Jerry Van Dyke. And uh, loved it. It was a job. I, really, I was doing a play at the ring, and they saw me there and cast me, and I went down. And so, <laughs> I tell you other stories about my family. My son came in once and said, uh, 
we, we had been to a, a church baseball game or something, and I was sitting down trying to watch a sporting event on a Sunday. He said, yeah, you know, John just called, and you're on television right now. You're on television. I said, well, what is it? He said, I, th I don't know. It's super something, super uh, uh, woman or super something, you know, $6 million woman or something like that, which is what Harv, Harv did. And I had done it. He goes, I'm going to go watch it. Okay. I'm watching. And he comes in, and he looks at me, and he goes, that was awful. That was awful. What a dumb story. What it was. Why did you do that? I said, Didn't you like the house we live in? Did you like the food we eat? Did you like the fact that you get new shoes every year? That's why I do it. So I've had a lot of fun. You just got to take it with you. Don't get too serious. Or do your work and just enjoy it. I can't put it any better than that. <laughs> Have we missed anything? Oh, I'm sure we've missed a lot, but I, I was, uh, I, 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 I Stories that I probably shouldn't tell on television. <laughs> now, I've been, uh, uh, David, it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful to be here and to talk about myself and remember things that I haven't talked about in a long time. It's terrific. Yeah, it's, it's a big thrill for me.